Hello again, Butterfly Conservation. It's me, Benito Wainwright, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Bristol who researches tropical butterflies. Now, you might remember me from a video I made for you last year where I failed to find a brimstone butterfly. <sighs> Zilch. Hmm. Yeah. When I say the word lepidopterist, you might think to yourself, What on earth does that mean? Or you might have the image of a classic 19th century explorer in the wilderness with a butterfly net in hand, aimlessly swinging it about, catching butterflies, right? Right? Well, although lepidopterists do spend significantly more time doing these activities than the average person, most of the time we're actually doing some hardcore science. It's the 21st century, after all. So to show you some of the hot, topics in lepidopteran or butterfly and moth research that are going on at the moment, we're going to have to leave the field and instead migrate to here, the Life Sciences Building. Ah yes, the Life Sciences Building at the University of Bristol has been my scientific home for the last eight years. Absolutely brimming in biological intellect, believe it or not, there are other people in here who are as mad about butterflies and moths as me. Now, lepidopteran research in the 21st century has come a long way since Darwin's day. The advancements of new technologies has provided a whole host of new opportunities to study the ecology, evolution and behaviour of butterflies and moths in unbelievable levels of detail. And to be honest, a lot of that hard graft is done by PhD students like me. Youthful, vibrant and full of energy. Oh, hi Chris. Stupid experiment, new and work. Well, except Chris. I'm currently on my way to the Ecology of Vision Lab, where PhD student Rochelle Mia is going to tell me all about the effect street lamps are having on our moths. This is the lab. Let's make our way inside. Ah. Rochelle? Rochelle? Oh, sorry. Hello, Rochelle? Benita, where are you? I'm outside with the moth trap and it's absolutely freezing. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise you were doing field work. Oh god, okay, sorry, yeah, we'll be in there, we'll be there in the jiffy. Goodness. Oh, hello Rochelle, wow. That's a really impressive setup you've got there. Can you really catch moths at this time of day? No, of course not, Benito. I've merely put this here for visual effect to make it look like I'm doing something useful. Oh, I see, right. Now, you study the effect light pollution has on insect behaviour, mm. right? So why are moths such useful animals to use in this context? Well, many moths undertake really long and very impressive migrations at night. And the precise visual cues that they use to do this is something that we're interested in. And it's very likely that light pollution from our cities are negatively impacting the way these animals are using these cues to undertake these migrations. I see. Now, I guess a lot of people might think that having more light at night might actually help a nocturnal insect navigate through its world. But I'm imagining a lot of the effects are going to be bad, right? Do you want to explain why that might be the case? Well, there are actually many ways in which light pollution hinders an animal's ability to navigate at night using several cues. Um, but I'm particularly interested in the way it impacts one particular cue that they are known to use, and that's called the moon's polarisation pattern. Right, okay, so what on earth is that all about then? Good question. Well, polarisation is a property of light that we humans can't see. But because of specialised structures in the eyes of the moths, they're able to detect it and use it to help them initiate and guide certain behaviours. And the moon's polarisation pattern is created when light from the moon hits our atmosphere and scatters in a really particular way. And it creates this band of polarisation in the sky. And you can kind of think of it like a massive compass needle in the sky that insects use to help them navigate their environment. And we know that light pollution messes up this polarisation pattern. So it makes it a less reliable cue for these animals to use and it might impact their ability to navigate. And for the past few years, I've been going to a lovely site in the Pyrenees, which is almost free of light pollution. So the perfect place for carrying out experiments on wild migratory moths. That sounds absolutely idyllic. A lot of hard work though, it sounds like. So how's the research going? Well, yeah, it's going really well, thanks Benito. But to be honest, it'd be going a lot better if I wasn't wasting my time here with you in this park. So see you later then. Oh, what? Michelle? But, but what about this moth trap? Michelle? Michelle? <laughs> Hi 
I'm now in the hidden vaults of the Bristol Museum's collection, home to hundreds of thousands of butterfly moth specimens, some of them dating back to over 200 years ago. And I'm here to meet PhD student Callum McClellan. Hello Callum, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Uh, do you mind if we stand up though, please? Yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> now, if I'm not much mistaken, you study not the butterfly adults themselves, but their larval forms. In other words, the caterpillars. Do you want to explain why they're of particular interest to you? Yeah, that's right. Uh, a lot of the time, I think the adult butterflies get all of the attention, which I think is a real shame because the caterpillars are absolutely fascinating. Now, caterpillars come in a wide array of really weird and wonderful behaviours, and also a huge variety of forms. Now, the caterpillar is the immature stage, so they can't reproduce. And also, it means that they don't need to be looking for a mate. So a lot of the bright colours that we see on caterpillars are likely for defence against predators. And now, one of the traits that I'm particularly interested in is their social behaviour. So if you look across the Lepidoptera, you'll find that many species of caterpillar have evolved to live in really large groups. So what I'm interested in researching is how does this behaviour prevent them from getting eaten? That's really, really interesting stuff, because when I think of caterpillars, I think of them as quite green, brown, basically using camouflage to hide in plain sight from predators. So the fact that many have evolved to group together and therefore appear more conspicuous seems a bit strange if you're trying to avoid being attacked. Do you have any ideas on how and why that may have evolved? Yeah, absolutely. If you'll follow me, yeah, I'll sure. explain on the way. So one of the main ideas is that these caterpillars use their bright coloration to warn predators that they may be uh, toxic, so they taste awful or may even be poisonous. Mm. So if you look across the animal kingdom, a lot of toxic species have evolved this bright warning coloration to warn predators not to eat them. So one of the uh, ideas with the caterpillars is that by grouping together, they can actually enhance the warning signal that they're putting out, so they make them more aversive to predators. Now, what we have here is an example of something much more simple going on. So this is known as the dilution effect. And um, what this basically is, is safety in numbers. So if you have a group of caterpillars that are toxic, and a predator comes along and eats one, so if you right, have a one, taste of one of these, and it oh, finds... Disgusting! Exactly! <laughs> and so now these, pre these caterpillars are much less likely to be eaten themselves. That's great. So what does your research involve on a day-to-day -day basis then? Well, so far my work has taken a comparative approach. So by looking at over a hundred different butterfly species and the traits that their larvae have evolved, um, I'm able to look at which traits, such as warning coloration, are more likely to result in grouping behaviour evolving. I'm also complementing this with work out in the field. So I've been using these fake caterpillars, but real predators, to test wh whether grouping behaviour and these other traits help these caterpillars to survive. Really cool, and I guess there's a lot of specimens to work with here at the museum, so what are you doing here today? What do you mean? You told me to come here to make the video. Here at the University of Bristol... Benito, we're... stop walking towards me. Oh, sorry, sorry. Here at the University of Bristol, we study butterflies from all over the world, but there's one Latin American group called the Heliconius butterflies that people here are particularly interested in. Their diverse ecologies, behaviour and evolution have meant they've fascinated biologists ever since Darwin, but there are still unsolved questions. And I'm about to speak to PhD student Jesse Foley, who's hoping to use these butterflies to answer the secret to an everlasting life. But anyway, let's hear it from the horse's mouth. <laughs> oh, actually, let's ask Jessie Foley instead. She'll know what she's on about, and she's in here. <sighs> right. right. Jessie? Jessie? Not again. <sighs> um, Max, um, sorry to bother you, um, but any idea where Jessie is? She left for field work in Panama two months ago, you idiot. Oh, did she? Oh. I've just told the viewers all about her heliconius work. I oh, know. Well, you could interview me instead, if you like. I guess I could. I mean, you work on heliconius, right? Mm. And it's the only option we have at this point. Um, okay, so, um, hi Max. Um, do you want to tell us what interesting heliconius work you get up to? 
Well, I work on a part of the butterfly brain, it's called the central complex, and it's very, very interesting because... Hey Benito, how's it going over there? I hope you're all good and bristle and Max isn't boring you about the central complex or anything like that. Um, so I'm out here in a place called the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in a small town called Gamboa in Panama. I'm at one of our butterfly houses right now. Um, and this place is really great because uh, it allows us to rear butterflies in like huge numbers in ways that we would never be able to do in Bristol and that we can assess a bunch of them all at once. And we're also right on the edge of the primary tropical rainforest, which means that we can go out and catch individuals and then come back here and combine that stuff with really sophisticated lab work. So it's a really exciting place to be for this kind of research. So as Benito mentioned, I study a genus of butterflies called Heliconius. Uh, and these are really interesting, they've actually been studied by evolutionary biologists for hundreds of years. But for me, what I'm personally interested in is their unusually long lifespans. So Heliconius can live for at least up to six months in the wild, but anecdotally up to almost 11 months in some butterfly houses. Uh, and this is among the longest lifespans of all butterflies studied. So there's an idea as to why this has evolved, and it's all got to do with their diet. So Heliconius are the only butterfly genus that are able to actually feed and digest pollen. Most other butterfly species just feed on nectar. And so we think that this access to a whole range of new nutrients that aren't available to those other, other butterflies might have helped them to achieve such extended lifespans. And I'm, that's a hypothesis, and I'm trying to kind of work on that by conducting a series of pollen deprivation experiments to see just how much this nutritional resource contributes to both their extended lifespan and also their aging. I'm also planning on combining this with some molecular work to see what it might be able to tell us about the evolution of aging in these very cute butterflies with these very long lifespans, and to see how that might even potentially be translated to therapeutic targets in humans. Anyways, I gotta go. Sorry, Benito, but I'm very busy, gotta run. Uh, good luck with the video. Hope you smile. I'll see you later. And that is why the central complex is so interesting, Benito. Benito? Benito? Benito! Oh! Now, we've already seen that butterflies and moths perceive their world in a completely different way to how we do. And although vision is their primary sense, there are a whole load of other senses which we're only just beginning to understand. I'm about to meet with electrical ecologist Sam England, who may not be able to fix your fuse box, but should be able to tell us about how butterflies and moths use electricity in their day-to-day -day lives. That's a toilet. Sorry. Here's the lab. Oh, hi Sam, how are you? Hello, what do you want? So Sam, because it's something we can't perceive, I guess electroreception might seem quite sci-fi to a lot of people, but lots of other animals are able to perceive electric fields, right? Do you want to explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, sure. So something that we're kind of maybe all aware of is that there's this thing called static charge, right? This is the thing that you experience when you rub a balloon on your head or you're bouncing on a trampoline and you get a static shock. Mm -hmm. These static charges produce electric fields and these electric fields can exert forces on other static charges. Now, something that people maybe won't be aware of is the fact that a lot of animals and plants in nature are actually sources of charge and so produce these electric fields. And what I'm really interested in looking at is basically whether these electric fields can have ecological consequences for these animals and plants. Can they uh, help or hinder them as they live their everyday lives? That's really cool. So why are butterflies and moths such useful animals to work with then? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of reasons for that, but I think first and foremost for me, I think what's really great about uh, butterflies and moths is that they're essentially two for one in terms of a study organism because you can do experiments on the caterpillar stage uh, of them, you know, doing experiments on whether they can, say, detect the static charge of their own predators. But then when you raise them into adulthood and they become butterflies or moths, you can do experiments on completely different ecological contexts like pollination or, for example, if a butterfly or a moth is approaching a flower to feed from it, um, could predators waiting on the flower, like a crab spider, detect the moth or the butterfly coming by that static electric field? That's really, really cool, because I guess if all animals are to some degree electrically charged, and that's quite an unavoidable cue that a predator could use to detect its prey, right? Um, you've got this rather sciencey looking piece of apparatus here, and I believe this is what you use for some of your experiments to test your hypotheses, right? Do you want to explain a little bit about how it works? Sure thing. So basically, the setup for this experiment is a behavioural one. So what we're doing here is we're playing the electrical signal that we expect to come off a statically charged wasp, which would be a predator for a caterpillar mm -hmm. like this. 
And we play these uh, WASP electrical signals through this uh, metal electrode here, mm. which is kind of acting like an electrical um, speaker. So it's mm. kind of, instead of making sound, it's making electricity. Yeah. And then we watch what the caterpillars do in response to these signals. And we look for behaviors like flailing or trying to bite the electrode that might indicate that the caterpillar is perceiving this electrical signal as a threat. Right, wow. Well, really advanced setup, Sam, I've got to say. It's a shame it's not plugged in though, isn't it? Get out. Okay. Well, there you have it. From long distance migrations to super sensors. From the evolution of group living to the evolution of elderliness. Butterflies and moths provide so much opportunity for exploration and discovery, enhancing our understanding of ecology and evolution as a whole. And the amazing team of scientists and the advanced facilities here at Bristol are playing a world leading role in making those discoveries happen. All very high tech, and as you can see, not a butterfly net to be seen. Oh, Mr. Daniel.